last episode, we looked at the Jahiliyyah, the pre-Islamic period. And we looked at some of the socio-political and the spiritual issues and the climates at the time of the Prophet ﷺ and right before the time of the Prophet ﷺ. In this episode, we're going to look at what the Qur'an says about the Prophet ﷺ right before revelation, before his first revelation. We will also look at some of the earliest examples of revelation. What did the Qur'an look like? How did it sound? And how was it received by the companions? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Duha, describing the childhood of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, أَلَمْ يَجِدْكَ يَتِيمًا فَآوَىٰ Did Allah not find you an orphan and then sheltered you? This ayah in Surah Al-Duha, we know that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was an orphan. And also history tells us that he was part of Quraysh, the most powerful tribe in Mecca. So belonging to a powerful tribe meant that he was an insider. Being an orphan meant that he got to experience the struggle of the outsider. This insider-outsider dynamic is one of the features that set the Prophet Muhammad up for success. He was not intimidated by the power of Quraysh. Like Musa السلام, who grew up in the palace of Fir'aun, the Prophet السلام, was raised in uh, close proximity with the elite. They did not intimidate him. He saw their humanness, recognized the limits, and saw beyond their prestige. It was all a facade for him. He was not captured by it, captivated by it. And as an orphan who lost both parents at a young age, he could also relate to the struggle of those who had nothing or very little. So being an orphan also meant that the Prophet Muhammad had less parental and familial pressures, which gave him more freedom to hold on to his fitrah, his natural and primordial instinct. Although the Prophet Muhammad did not have one primary caregiver, he had several caregivers to learn from and be critical of. Halima, his foster mother, Abdul Muttalib, his grandfather, and his uncle, Abu Talib. He was able to receive the nurturing upbringing from them, but he also remained courteous and dutiful to each one of them, but not uncritical. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَوَجَدَكَ عَائِلًا فَأَغْنَى Allah found you needy, poor, and satisfied your needs. So the Quran tells us that Muhammad was not very wealthy early on in his life. In fact, Abu Huraira narrates that the Prophet Muhammad says, ما بعث الله نبيا إلا رعى الغنم. Allah has not sent anybody except as a Prophet, except that that person served as a shepherd. They said, وأنت يا رسول الله, even you يا رسول الله. He said, even me. I used to take care of the Meccan sheep for less than a penny. على قراريط. Being a shepherd, we imagine, taught him a lot about leadership, discipline, emotional management, what it's like to care for people, what it's like to emotionally manage difficult situations. The books of history tell us that the Prophet Muhammad moved on to work for a businesswoman named Khadija. And he quickly built a reputation as someone who was very honest and trustworthy as a young man. Khadija was a widow who was previously married two times. She had a daughter from the first marriage and three children from the second marriage. After the death of her second husband, Khadija managed the inheritance from that second husband well enough to build an empire for herself, a large business that earned her the respect of the businessmen of her time. Remember the last episode, we said that women were buried alive in Mecca. So imagine here is a woman who built a reputation for herself and built an empire. Khadija saw Muhammad from afar and she was impressed by what she saw and heard about him. Unlike the other women, she knew what men were like because she dealt with them on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Well, a lot of women did, but she, had, she, had, she was privy to extra information. She had critical eyes. So she watched Muhammad from, a, uh, from afar and she watched him close. And when she heard what she heard about him, she wanted to test him. She wanted more insight. So she told the man that worked for her, Maisara, to keep an eye on him during one of the business trips to the Levant to the sham. And when Maisara came back, he only had positive things to say. Muhammad was this and Muhammad was that and he did this and he did that. And he was incredibly uh, generous in the way that he described Rasulullah So Khadija was convinced and she sent an official marriage proposal. Now imagine, here's a woman proposing to a man in the Jahiliyyah. It's not common, but it shows you how much People respected and admired Muhammad وسلم, before revelation. Now Khadija, uh, when she proposed to Rasulullah Rasulullah asked his family for advice. Everyone told him, don't hesitate. 
She is a noble woman. She has all the qualities that would make her an excellent spouse. Do not hesitate. Get married. Soon after, 40-year-old Khadija marries Muhammad وسلم, at the age of 25. And they had seven children together throughout their marriage. Al-Qasim died young. Al-Tahir died young. Ruqayya, Zainab, Umm Kulthum lived to get married and the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, saw them get married but they also died, passed away in the Prophet Sallallahu life. Fatim is the only child that lived to witness the death of Rasulullah Sallallahu But as he brought her close on his deathbed, he told her something that made her cry and he told her something else that made her smile. So the first thing that he said to her, my time has come and she was emotional. And then he told her, but you would be the first from my family to come after me. And that made her smile. Soon after the marriage, Khadija told Rasulullah Sallallahu that she trusted him with all that she had and she asked him to manage her business, transferring all the power and wealth to him. Now, pause for a second. In a society that buried females alive, here's a woman saying to her husband, I trust you with this more than I trust myself. Willingly investing all that she had in her husband, which perhaps is one of the greatest testaments of his character. It's not surprising then that Rasulullah says about Khadija, Inni wallah qad ruziqatu hubbaha. I have by Allah been blessed with her love. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa grew Khadija's business and he became one of the most respected and notable business people. And he earned the trust and the respect of the businessmen of his time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَوَجَدَكَ عَائِلًا فَأَغْنَى Did he not find you needy? and he satisfied your needs. So at the age of 35, treasure got stolen from the Kaaba, and there was no roof on the Kaaba. So the Meccans decided to rebuild the Kaaba, and they decided to add a roof on top of the Kaaba. And in order to rebuild it, they had to, to rebuild it, they had to break the walls. Walid ibn al-Mughira was the only one who was brave enough to go into the walls and to break them down, or to start by tapping on the walls. Every tribe shared the responsibility of the building, Someone had to be picked to put the black stone back up. Abu Umayyah ibn al-Mughira, the first person to walk in, he said, let the person who walks in first be the one to do it. And it was Muhammad sallallahu Now, when they looked at him, they said, yes, this is a man who's honest. This is a man who's sincere. We love him. He will be the one to make this decision. And what did he do? Look at the wisdom of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Before revelation, five Years before he was initiated into prophethood. What does he say? He says, give me a piece of cloth. And what I'll do is I'll put the black stone on it. And then everybody will take a section and hold the black stone or hold the cloth that's holding the black stone and put it back into the place where it's to be, um, put it back in its proper place. Now, subhanAllah, this shows you the wisdom of Rasulullah Sallallahu and the community respected his decision. Now before we talk about the house of Allah, it's important to understand why the house of Allah mattered. Who are these Qurayshis? Who are these Meccans? And why were they, uh, again, so keen on maintaining their power? It's important to understand the context a little bit. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us in the Quran, the first house that was built to worship Allah was built in Mecca. It became a sanctuary and a guide, a source of guide for all the people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us in here, in this ayah, that this was a sanctuary, a sanctuary, a place of safe haven. Now, the Arabs built their power and they justified their power by saying, we are the descendants of Ismail. Allah chose us to take care of this house. We're carrying his legacy and we're carrying on the religious teachings of Ismail. Even though they added and they changed and they corrupted and they removed and they deleted, but they justified all of that and they said, we are the ones that are custodians of the Kaaba. Subhanallah. 
Now in addition to that, just to contextualize things a little bit better, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us or reveals two surahs early on to talk about and to appeal to Quraysh, to get Quraysh to revive the sense of gratitude. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds them of Surah Al-Feel. أَلَمْ تَرَ كَيْفَ فَعَلَ رَبُّكَ بِأَصْحَابِ الْفِيلِ أَلَمْ يَجْعَلْ كَيْدَهُمْ فِي تَضْلِيلِ وَأَرْسَلَ عَلَيْهِمْ طَيْرًا أَبَابِيلِ تَرْمِيهِمْ بِحِجَارَةٍ مِّنْ سِجِّيلِ فَجَعَلَهُمْ كَعَصٍ مَأْكُولِ Why is this surah important? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the same year that the Prophet Muhammad was born, there was an attack on the Kaaba. We all know the story of Abraha. The story of Abraha where he built his own sanctuary and he says, you know what? We're going to take all the attention away from Mecca. We're going to get everybody to come and do pilgrimage around our house. So we have some security and some economic gain like the Meccans have. When he built this little sanctuary of his, nobody came. So he decided, I'm going to, you know, think about what does Mecca have that we don't. And he was already making a plan to attack the Kaaba. And it took one person from Mecca to come and to basically, uh, you know, subhanAllah, dis disrespect this sanctuary that he uh, built, but urinating on it. So this, this guy from Mecca came and said, you know, this is, what is this here? Nonsense. He urinated on it to show them disrespect. This is not a house of Allah. You guys made this up. So Abraha used this to justify an attack on the Kaaba. And he rallied the troops and he went, the troops, and he went and he tried to attack the Kaaba. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us what happened here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al fil. O Quraysh, don't you remember? Didn't you see? Didn't you witness? Didn't you hear what happened when the people came to try to attack your house? Alam yaj'al kaydahum fi tadlil. Did Allah not ruin their plot? Wa arsala alayhim tayran ababin. And did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not send uh, uh, you know, birds with, with, with rocks that would pour the rocks down? and basically uh, to, you know, uh, punish those who came to attack the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding them that the fact that you have a house is from Allah, and the fact that it's protected is from Allah, but most importantly, the Quraysh built a reputation for themselves by saying, look, we must be holding on to truth, we must be good, why? Because God protected our house. And now they use this as a means to increase their public image, and increase their public honor in front of the rest of, in front of the, uh, the the rest of the tribes. So they said, "Don't mess with us because we have God on our side." So their caravans were able to go right and left, west and east, and nobody would touch them in a society where everybody was attacking the caravans. Quraysh's caravan could walk and go wherever it wanted because it's the caravan of Quraysh. And not only that, it was protected because if you were to go and do pilgrimage. You're going to go back to Quraysh. So you don't want to hurt their caravan because then they would deprive you from going to the house of Allah. So they had so much on their side. And because of that, they had the socioeconomic power, they had the privilege, they had the responsibility as well. And they took the privilege without delivering on the responsibility. And that's why Allah reminds them in Surah Quraysh, لِإِلَافِ Quraysh, إِلَافِهِمْ رِحْلَةَ الشِّتَاءِ وَالصَّيْفِ فَلْيَعْبُدُوا رَبَّ هَذَا الْبَيْتِ الَّذِي أَطْعَمَهُمْ مِنْ جُوعٍ وَآمَنَهُمْ مِنْ خَوْفٍ To remind Quraysh of the favor that Allah has done upon them and for them, let them reflect on the trip to the Levant, رحلة الشتاء والصيف and to Yemen, the trip, to, the trip of the summer and the trip of the winter. So Allah secured the caravans. So what, they sh what should they do? فَلْيَعْبُدُوا رَبَّ هَذَا الْبَيْتِ Show gratitude, worship the Lord of this house. الَّذِي أَطْعَمَهُمْ مِّنْ جُوعٍ The one who satisfied their hunger. وَآمَنَهُمْ مِّنْ خَوْفٍ And allowed them to be secure. But instead, what did they do? Instead of being grateful, we'll come and come to realize together that they looked for opportunities to defy, to be arrogant, as we'll see together. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا كُنْتَ تَتْلُو مِنْ قَبْلِهِ مِنْ كِتَابٍ وَلَا تَخُطُّهُ بِيَمِينِكِ إِذَا لَرْتَابَ الْمُبْطِنُونَ You Muhammad never wrote before. You could not read any writing before this revelation, nor could you write at all. Otherwise, the people of falsehood 
would have been suspicious. So the Quran tells us that the Prophet Muhammad did not read or write. And the Prophet's illiteracy here is framed in the Quran as a blessing, as something positive. Why? Because it's because of his illiteracy that no one could doubt the authenticity of the Quran. They couldn't say you access, you access previous scriptures, you on your business trips sat down and you wrote and you collected. Of course he was acquainted with information here and there as any business person would be, but it wasn't his focus. He wasn't looking out for religious knowledge. It wasn't, it wasn't part of his life, right? He was, yes, he was honest, trustworthy, a man of principles, never bowed down to an idol, never drank, never engaged in any of these bad things that we discussed in the previous episode. But for the most part, he lived the life of a regular man in Quraysh and in Mecca. The financial independence, as we spoke about, the Khadija offered him because of the marriage, gave him the time to look at himself and look at society and think deeply about the community's issues. And he noticed all the injustices and said, you know, I want to do something about this. I want to fix the contradictions of my society. Now, he tells us that he did not bow down to an idol, as we mentioned, did not engage in any drinking or any acts of the Jahiliyyah, but he was concerned for his community. But he did not know how to tackle these situations and these problems in his community. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, listen to this carefully, وَوَجَدَكَ ضَالًّا فَهَدَى Did Allah not find you unguided, looking for answers, and then guided you? His kindness, His compassion, His concern for others prompted Him to look for solutions. He retreated away from the community, looking for answers. He spent time in the mountains reflecting, looking for the right place until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed him to see visions. As Aisha tells us, he would see something at night and it would happen in the day. So he got excited. I'm onto something here. And he continued to do this more and more and more until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed him the cave of Hira in his visions. So he retreated to the cave and he started to spend time there meditating and meditating. And from that view, he could look at Mecca and see how small the world was. It's like when you get on a, on a plane and you're traveling, you look down and you say, the world is so small. It's not what we should be living for. Materialistic pleasure, holding on to it is like holding on to water with open fingers. You'll feel the rush, but none of it remains. There's more out there. This is not the only thing. So he started to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask for clarity and guidance. Now what's amazing here, his wife, Khadija, was his big, biggest support. She would look for opportunities to help him and to support him and to come and give him food. And that's why he said, Wallahi, no one was as supportive than Khadija. When you look at everybody else, you see subhanAllah the support of Khadija, who was the first sponsor financially of Islam. And this here, I want us to just pause and reflect on the importance of a secure relationship with your wife, with your husband. How many of us, let's just be honest for a second. How many of us imagine if you as a husband tell your wife, you know, I'm looking to solve the community's problems. I want to go on top of a mountain in a cave somewhere. I need to retreat away from all of this noise. You wife be like, oh really? Yeah, you want to go on a retreat somewhere? Uh, is retreat another word for a second wife? A lot of doubt, a lot of confusion, right? A lot of distrust. But Khadija trusted Rasulullah That's what I want to emphasize here. She trusted him. She would support him and she said, keep going. You'll have my support. I'm there by your side. Now there were things that were happening at the time that projected and foreshadowed some event, some major event is about to happen. Allah tells us in Surah Al-Jinn, the jinn which are creature, creatures like us, but they're made of uh, fire and we are made of you know, clay as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran. The jinn themselves noticed that some things were changing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَنَّا لَمَسْنَا السَّمَاءَ The word of the jinn here, فَوَجَدْنَاهَا مُلِئَتْ Earlier, we tried to reach the heavens for news, only to find that it filled, it was filled with stern guards and shooting stars. We used to go up into the skies, into the heavens, and we used to sit and gather some news, what the angels are doing, what's, what's going on. But now, there's no more gathering. All of these seats are gone and these shooting stars would come and they would basically burn anybody who tried to collect information. So what the jinn are saying is that there's something going on here. The ability to collect information and to go up is no longer given to them, which is signifying 
that something major is about to happen. Just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected the house, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is protecting the heavens so that revelation would come down for the Prophet Muhammad and it would, be, it would be basically inaccessible to any other creature, inaccessible to any other beings from the angel directly to Allah, or to, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly through the angel to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The jinns say, وَأَنَّا لَا نَدْرِي أَشَرٌ أُرِيدَ بِمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ أَمْ أَرَادَ بِهِمْ رَبُّهُمْ رَشَدًا We have no clue whether this evil is intended, whether something evil is intended for those on earth or whether their Lord intends for them to be guided. Now, my brothers and my sisters, we have looked at the events building up to the first revelation. The Prophet Muhammad would find himself in the cave alone in Ramadan of the year 610. And when he's alone, worshipping, praying, expecting, he doesn't know what to expect, but he's hoping, wishing for something that would allow him to fix the problems in society. Out of nowhere, an angel appears from behind, taking the form of a physical being. And he grabs him and he shakes him and he holds him tight to the point where he exhausted the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he instructs him three times. Iqara, Iqara, read, recite. He's, imagine the shock. First, he doesn't know what to say. The second time, Iqara, he doesn't know what to say. The third time, Iqara, he says, what is going on? What, what do you want me to read? What is it that you want me to, I don't know how to read. Then Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala revealed the first revelation. Read, O Muhammad, in the name of your Lord who created. He created the human being from a substance that hangs. Recite, and your Lord is the most generous. The one who taught by the pen. Allah is the one who taught the human what the human knows not. Indicating that there's some beautiful information, news that would come to the Prophet Muhammad But the Prophet Muhammad was not aware yet. The angel disappeared. And the Prophet Muhammad in anxiety and confusion ran to his wife Khadija. Cover me, cover me. Zammiluni, zammiluni. He said, May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. Thank you for joining us. And Ramadan Mubarak. See you next time.